So I was asked to speak this evening on the subject of parenting. And I think most of us know it's a subject that we, we generally don't relish speaking on, mostly because for, for a lot of us, it's a work in progress. And I think most of us feel, my, certainly myself included, feel sheepish about the subject because the jury is, is out, right? The jury is not yet made its decision on how our own parenting has gone. I have seven children myself. My oldest will be 13 next month, all the way down to a one-year-old, hopefully soon to have eight in just a couple, couple months, a few months. Uh, and so my children are generally at a younger stage. And uh, certainly we're very pleased with how it's gone so far. Uh, we are very thankful for the children that we have, their dispositions, their attitudes, uh, but we recognize there's lots of things to work on and a long way to go. And so I say all this because it's a subject that I certainly don't claim to, claim to be an expert on. However, what I'm gonna be doing here is not presenting my views on this, but I'm gonna be presenting scripture's views on this. And because of that, I can have a lot of confidence. And I, I hope to convince you by the time this brief citywide is over, that there is in fact a very good pattern and a, a set of principles that are presented in scripture in a couple of key passages. Of course, there's many places where scripture speaks about parenting, but this is something that I, I know that for, for all of us who are looking for that, that anchor of confidence, that, that ability to, to gain that foothold that most of us so badly want, the best place to go and the most secure place is to the word of God. So with that, I'm going to share my screen here. I've got a few passages from scripture that I wanna show you all. The first one here is from Psalm chapter 74. This is a beautiful Psalm, I'll, I'll read it here. It says, my people hear my instruction, listen to the words from my mouth. I will declare wise sayings. I will speak mysteries from the past things we have heard and known and that our fathers have passed down to us. We will not hide them from their children, but will tell a future generation the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, his might and the wondrous works he has performed. He has established a testimony in Jacob and set up the law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children so that a future generation, children yet to be born might know they are to rise and tell their children so that they might put their confidence in God and not forget God's works, but keep his commands. All right, why did I start with this passage here? This passage is an, an excellent passage that shows what God's plan is for the propagation of the faith. It's his plan A. His plan A is that the, the parents, the fathers, transmit their faith, they teach their faith to the next generation. And then did you notice here in verse six, it talks about those children telling the next generation of children. So we have three generations encapsulated in the Psalm here where each generation is passing on the faith to the subsequent one. So that in verse seven, they might put their confidence in God and not forget God's works, but keep his commands. The last citywide, or maybe the next to last citywide that I gave, I talked about the importance of family worship and family devotions as the centerpiece of how our family should be ordered. And this applies to people who are single as well. And I'm going to try to make this talk even today general for not just parents, but those who are single. Uh, there are school teachers on this call. There are people who uh, are uncles and aunts and siblings and in some way play a role in shaping that next generation. But I wanna just begin by saying that this is what the Bible says time and time again, particularly in the Psalms, but you see this in other places, we'll look at one in a moment, that our faith is generally supposed to be passed down from generation to generation. Okay, it's an obvious point, but sometimes the most obvious points are the best points. And I will say that, and this is, these are my parents here, because I was raised in an evangelical, home in, I was born and raised in Southern California. And I will say without any doubt at all that the vast majority of my own faith 
did not come from preachers in church or Sunday school teachers or any kind of church activity, it came from the home. Uh, and I would say a combination of the home and then once that got going, just my own desire to read and study and pursue God on my own, those were the, the two greatest. And then after that came the church. So it was really first being discipled by my parents, then discipling myself uh, through through uh, just time in prayer, time studying the word of God. And then third, and I would say a distant third, came the role of the church. Now that might surprise you, but if you listen to my last message, and if you remember that, hopefully it won't surprise you, that we need to remember that the primary place where discipleship should begin is in the home. Uh, and again, that was a lot of what I spoke about in my last message. So if you haven't heard that, I hope that you can go back and listen to that. And I'm going to say that I have noticed this very consistently in many, many people that I know uh, from many different walks, backgrounds, ethnicities, that they were much, uh, they were formed in a much greater extent by their parents and their home life than they were by the church. Now, I love, as all of you know, I love the church. I have written about it. I, I speak so highly of the importance of the church. And so this is not in any way to diminish the role of the church, but we have to have it in its proper context. And the church is not designed to function absent the role of parents who are stepping up and doing their job as the primary disciplers of their children. Okay, so this is one of the classic texts that's used in, in talks about parenting. And I think it's for very good reason. So we're gonna read this, it's a familiar passage here from Deuteronomy 6, and it's God speaking through Moses, who says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Okay, beautiful passage, famous passage. The verse four is often called the Shema. It's in Hebrew, the word here or listen is Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Uh, this, this passage here usually is, is treated, verse four is, is, verse four and five are often treated as separate from the rest of the passage. But of course, that's a huge mistake. We know that there were not chapters and verses in the original Bible. It was read in a continuous manner. And when you read this passage from the perspective of it being about the propagation of faith, what strikes me, what jumps out at me, and you may not have noticed this in your reading, is that if you read it in that light, verse four and five can be directed at the parents, right? So the, the parents or the adults here are, I think most people would say generally assumed to be the recipients of this speech because in verse seven, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Okay, so the, the parents are being addressed here and they have this job of teaching them, teaching these things to the children. So what does this imply? This implies that in verse four and five, the first step of parenting is making sure that the parents love God with all of their heart, soul, and strength. You can't really go further than four and five uh, unless you've done that basic foundational preparatory work here. The, those who are involved in the enterprise of discipling their children need to begin with verses four and five. They need to love God with all their heart, their soul, and their strength. Now we could spend hours and hours and hours talking about that, and I, and I think we have in different settings about what does it mean to love God? What does it mean for us to be devoted to God? But this is the beginning, right? This is the beginning that the parents have to start with this foundation of a very robust, deep, devoted love for God. Okay, then after that, after verses four and five, says these words which I command you today, and again, taking in context, it's basically the whole book of Deuteronomy, which is mostly a book of commands that God gives to the Israelites about how they're supposed to live. 
And he says that these words I command you to shall be in your heart. Okay, very interesting. So that reinforces what was described in four and five, that the, the propagation of the faith, this passing down to the faith from one generation to the next, begins with the words of God being in the hearts of the parents. This means reading. This means memorizing. This means talking about it. This means living it out. Uh, it should just be filling your mind all day long. Then, and only then, after four, five, and six, does God through Moses get to verse seven, where he says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Okay, now let's pause for a moment here and think about the word diligent. Okay, so the word diligent is a word that we all know. Uh, it's a word that is uh, a great word. And I want to say that it's a word that communicates something different from how, how most of us, I think, live our lives. You know, if you ask most people, how was their day? How are you doing? They'll say, oh, I'm really busy, right? Most people, oh, busy, busy, busy. And there's a huge difference, though, between being busy and being diligent. Diligent communicates a sense of intentionality. It communicates a sense of purpose and a sense of depth. You know, when I hear the word busy, I picture almost like a fly buzzing around going from point A to point B, which is often how we can feel. When I hear the word diligent, I think of someone who is intentional. They have their eyes on a goal and they are working uh, hard for that goal. What, what we are being challenged to in this passage here is to have our discipleship be something that is diligent. Now, what all of us should think about is what are we diligent about in our life? Okay, so what are the things that if we look at, are we the most diligent at? Some people will say, oh, it's, it's my school. And I think that's a, a, fair, a fair rendition for a lot of people of what their lives are like. They are diligent at school. They work hard. They're working 60, 70 hours a week at school. For a lot of people, it's their business. For others, it's some project that they have going. It's, it's building something or gardening or who knows what. But what is in that diligent category for you right now? If I were to say to you, what, what are you the most diligent about? That hopefully will give a frame for what the Bible intends here, because we are supposed to be as or more diligent about discipling our children than we are about any other activity of our life. This is not something that is easy to do, right? Again, the word diligent communicates you're, you're sweating, you're striving, you're working hard on this. And shall talk, okay, so on this topic of diligence, another thing I'm going to say is that if you are not actively pursuing getting better at your parenting through a variety of means, talking to people, reading books, working with your spouse, investing in your children, I'm going to say that you're probably not meeting the basic criteria of verse seven, that we are called to be diligent in this. One of the things that I've been doing with uh, Brother Charlton, which I've enjoyed over the last year, we've been reading books together on on fathering and parenting, and we meet every Friday morning, and we just we've been reading and discussing these books, and I've been growing in that. It's been great for me, and I I always want to be pushing myself to get better as a parent. I want to be diligent in this pursuit, and again, I think Deuteronomy here is telling us that that's how we're to live our lives. Okay, so now now. We're supposed to love God. We're supposed to have God's words in our heart. We're supposed to be diligent. And what does this diligence look like? It's a lot, he elaborates here. We're supposed to talk of them, what are them, the commands. When we sit in our house, when we walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. So there's four, there's four venues here that are portrayed as being where this diligence is, is being communicated. So the first one is when you're sitting in your house. Uh, so this is very appropriate for our, our message today. It's when you're doing the activities of life, when you're schooling, we're, we're big homeschool advocates and followers of the way uh, because of exactly this principle. Uh, it's when you're sitting at your meals and you're talking. It's when you're playing uh, games together and you're sitting in your living room. All the different times that you're sitting in your house, we're supposed to be communicating and talking about scripture. When you walk by the way, of course, in this day and age, they didn't have cars and planes and trains. They had 
cars and very rare, I mean, sorry, they had their feet um, and they would only walk and very rarely someone would probably be able to travel by, by horse or some kind of four footed animal like that, like a, maybe a mule or a donkey. But, but in general, people walked, right? That was how, if you wanted to get around, you got around. And walking takes a long time, right? Even if you have to go a couple miles, you're talking 40 minutes there. And this was a culture of walking. This was the way that they spent a lot of their time was just walking around. So I, when I hear this, I think of this is the whole realm of activities that is your, your uh, outside world where you're just going from point A to point B. And when the father's there with the son, when the mother's there with the daughter, whatever the combinations, they're supposed to be talking about God's word. When you lie down, bedtime and the time around bedtime is one of the best times to talk about the word of God. Uh, that's when we happen to do our own family devotions. Uh, we often read another book together when our children go to bed. It's a very special time to connect there. And then when you rise up in the morning. So I, uh, one of the advantages of this period with COVID-19 is that I've been at home. Normally I'm, I'm gone when everyone's eating breakfast, but I've been able to be home now when everyone's eating breakfast. And I just love hearing how my wife uh, is sitting at the breakfast table. They read the Bible together. They're reading books together. They're talking. It's just, it's beautiful. This is exactly what Deuteronomy 6 is supposed to be about. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You're supposed to write scripture anywhere and everywhere. Uh, this is something that should dominate our, our spaces, right? This is something that I, I always like when I go, come into someone's house and I see scripture written in different places there. Uh, it, it communicates the spirit of following what verse eight is talking about. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So it's not just for you internally, but you're sharing with the outside world. This is what makes us who we are. We have this testimony of being a godly family. This is why the, the commands of the Lord, the scriptures there are, are showcased to the world as an invitation to join in the ways of God and the blessed life that ensues. Now, one of the things that a lot of people struggle with when they think of Deuteronomy 6 is they think, well, you're talking about these commands like all the time, it says here, right? Uh, when, you're, uh, when you're sitting in your home, when you're walking, when you're lying down, when you're getting up, I mean, how much can you really talk about this? And I wanna challenge everyone here to embrace repetition in a world that lusts after novelty. We, we live in a world that just can hardly stand to do the same thing twice, watch the same thing twice, read the same thing twice, much to our detriment. Isn't it interesting, though, that the way that God has naturally made us is that we, we enjoy repetition, particularly young children. So uh, I happen to have a, a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and they love reading the same books again and again and again and again. And for an adult, we can be in our hearts like, ah, oh, do I want to read this again, the same story again, and I already know the words, and ah, oh, come on, let's do something different. But embedded in a child is this God-given delight for repetition. Chesterton has a great quote about this. I'm not going to read that now. But this, this notion that, that repetition is something to be avoided, which is what the world says, in contrast to what Deuteronomy says, we're, we're supposed to be repeating and reframing and re-examining and looking at scripture from all these different angles is the heart and soul of what discipleship is. I often say this at Sattler, I'll say this here as well. Most people, they read too many books and they internalize too few books. They're just going from book to book to book to book and they're like, oh yeah, this is great. I really got some neat thoughts here. Six months later, they've forgotten it and it doesn't really meaningful, meaningfully change their life. It's way better to have a smaller number of books that you're reading and rereading that actually change you rather than jump from book to book. Okay, so we need to remember this. This is a, an important part of what parenting entails. All right, next point here, we learn virtues by imitation, not by lecture. So as part of that Deuteronomy 6 concept, you're, you're, you're walking with your, your parents through all these different spaces and places. And this, this basic idea that virtues are more caught than taught is widely appreciated. In fact, uh, Aristotle, who wrote, who writes long after 
Moses says basically exactly the same thing. As, as he's looking at how most people acquire their virtues, they say, well, most people, they just do this by, by imitation. They're in very subtle ways copying, um, or maybe not so subtle ways, copying the, the behavior of those around them. Uh, without naming the specific child, we have a child, we've had children over the years who it's so cute and endearing to watch them uh, during our, our times of family devotion when I'll ask questions. And what they'll do is they'll listen for what the older child will say, and they're, they're lagged by about a second or so, and they're repeating word for word what the older child is saying, and they're presenting it almost as if it's their own. And of course, it's not meant in a deceitful way, just as a, an imitative way. So if I say, uh, where did Paul begin his missionary journey? And the one child says Antioch, and then the other one will say Antioch. And it's just, it's so interesting to watch how natural this process of imitation is. Watch children play, right? They love to imitate. This is a God-given aspect of, of who we are in that imitation is right in our very nature from childhood on up. So for this reason, the Deuteronomy 6 paradigm here we have to conceive of this really as the marriage of both verbal instruction as well as a life that is embodying those virtues. And in general, um, I think certainly this is my case, I will, I will say that you, you probably are, are picking up probably 80 to 90% of you is the imitation part and maybe 10 to 20% is the lecture part. You know, it's, it's so interesting for myself. I, um, I often think about like, you know, how, how did I become who I am? And I know so much of it, as I mentioned before, is just this subconscious imitation of my, my parents, particularly my dad. And my dad is a starter. He loves to, to build things and start organizations. And I started a Bible college in North India and, and I started, started lots of churches and all that. And years later, I didn't even think about it. I thought, wow, I've actually just copied so much of my dad's life and I didn't he didn't ask me to do that like there was never a point where he said okay you need to do this you need to do this I just did it it came from a deep part of who I am because of this virtue imitation that that is just deep 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 inside of all of us and also related to Deuteronomy 6 this is a a, a line that I want to encourage everyone to just burn into your brain. I, I say this a lot to myself. I say, you cannot delegate relationship. You just cannot delegate relationships. I'm in a mode in my life now, uh, as my business has grown, as I've gotten more responsibilities, I'm always thinking about how can I delegate this? How can I get this off my plate? Who can I give this to? That's just, that's one of my first thoughts that I have now in my forties is I'm at a different phase than I was in my, my thirties and twenties. But what is the one thing that you can't delegate? You cannot delegate relationship. I can't say I want a relationship with my son or my daughter. Okay, I'm gonna hire someone to do that. It just doesn't work. This is one of the reasons why I am a strong advocate of homeschooling because you know, people ask all the time, why do you homeschool? And I never say, I never, ever, ever, ever say academic reasons because it's just not the reason why. I do believe you get a great or even better academic education from homeschooling. But the primary reason that we homeschool is because we can't delegate relationship. We need to form those relationship. And as I've shown you from that Psalm 74 passage, these relationships are the God-given means of changing your children's hearts and drawing your children into the ways of God. Period, full stop. This is the way that it's been for millennia. This is the way that it's supposed to be. And we need to look and beware of any trap that is going to take us away from this investment of time that we're going to make into our children and, uh, and just, just be so vigilant for this. I mean, there's, there's going to be lots and lots of ways where we are all tempted to, to delegate relationships, to delegate this channel that God has given us to change our children's hearts, to draw them into the ways of God. We can't do it. And again, Imagine someone in Deuteronomy 6 saying, okay, you know what, God, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to hire somebody else to try to do this. No, that's not the way it's supposed to be. We as the parents are, are charged with this responsibility. Okay, so why is parenting hard? So I just mentioned here from this Deuteronomy 6 passage, 
some of the contours of what parenting was supposed to be like in Old Testament Israel. But on top of that, we see other concepts here. So the first is that we're blind to our own faults. I, I think there's probably few areas of life where we can't see our own flaws and yet we can see others, others' flaws, right? So this is where we are just blind as a bat to the mistakes that we make in parenting, but yet we're really good at seeing others' mistakes. One of the main benefits, I would say, of the community living that many of us have embraced here, and wow, living here on on Oakland Street for all these years, we've seen this happen time and time and time and time again, is that all of us are being, all of the parents are being refined by the input of other parents into our own parenting. Uh, this is huge. Uh, we've had this year, I'm gonna guess, four to six pretty heavy conversations about different parenting issues that different ones of us have had. And I thank God for this because you can you can deny it if you want but you're blind to it you just are and you need to get other people to speak into your life about this and if you're lacking this or you don't want it this is going to be to your detriment and to your folly in addition parenting is hard because the default state of a child is foolishness this is proverbs 22 15 foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child okay i love that that picture it's just it's it's intertwined, foolishness is intertwined with the fibers of, of, of the, your child's heart, it just is. I mentioned we have a one-year-old right now, and wow, you can see it, he can't talk yet, he has a couple words here and there, but the toy that he has in his hand becomes much less interesting if there's another toy somewhere in his presence where he can see it, and doesn't want that anymore, and if you try to put that old toy back in his hand while he's on the lookout for toy number two, He's gonna throw that thing to the ground and just think like you were just so happy 10 seconds ago, but just because something new came into your, your visual fields, now all of a sudden this old toy is just trash to you and you're gonna get mad if somebody tries to put it back in your hand. I mean, it's just, it's foolishness, right? You can see this at such a young age and it persists all throughout the years of childhood and potentially beyond. So this means that any parent has to just keep in mind, okay, I am starting here with a fool. I have been given uh, a, a tremendous gift, but that gift is starting off with foolishness all bound up inside of this package. This makes it hard, right? And this is something that should hopefully also be encouraging when we have hard days because we're just colliding with a natural foolishness that's enmeshed within a child's soul. This is another passage in Proverbs. It says basically the same thing. A child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. So whatever your child's default state is, it's wrong. It's just wrong. It's, this is the consequence of the fall. This is the consequence of our sin, that we are dealing with raw material here that's broken. So we have this kind of double problem, right? We're blind to our own faults. We don't see it. And the second problem is that the raw material that we're handling is, is bound up with, with folly. So this is a pretty significant problem that we have to deal with uh, right at the outset. However, I'm gonna give a couple of verses that should give us some, some comfort and hopefully patience as well. This is a fascinating passage. Again, a well-known passage from 1 Samuel 3. This is about Samuel when he was a boy. I'll read it here. So now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. That's verse one of Samuel, for Samuel three. And then verse seven says, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. Okay, so I put those ellipses there between verses one and seven, uh, just to not have the whole screen filled up with lots of text, but to show you that there's almost a, a contradiction in these two verses. So it says on the one hand, that the boy Samuel is ministering, he's serving, he's worshiping uh, the, the Lord there before Eli, who's the high priest. And so you have this boy who's doing all these activities and he's serving God, but at the same time, he doesn't even know God, nor was the word of God yet revealed to him. And of course, later on, the word of God is revealed to him. And so there's this very interesting sequence here that is 
laid out in scripture where you can have a child who's actually genuinely, I believe Samuel was genuine in verse one here, that is genuinely ministering to the Lord, that is genuinely in the sincerity of childhood. They're, they're singing, they're worshiping, they're reading the Bible, and yet they don't really know God yet. They don't know God, uh, nor was the word of God yet revealed to that child. There's going to be a point later on where the light comes on uh, and Samuel figures out who he is, who God is, and he becomes, of course, the great prophet who ordains kings and becomes such an important force in, in Israel. But this should be encouraging because there is a time of parenting. There is a season of parenting where children are on the one hand ministering to God, but on the other hand, they don't know God. And this means that that, that investment that in this case, Eli is making into Samuel, that Hannah is making into Samuel, that Elkanah is putting into Samuel, that these investments are going to bear fruit later. And you may not see it at the time, but you got to keep going. You got to keep going and know that these, these seasons of, of pouring into a child and investing, they may not yet manifest in the ways that we all would like them to as soon as we would like them to. Very similar pattern with the disciples. This is John 12, where it says, his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. So you, you again, you see this pattern where Jesus is on the one hand telling them very plainly, the son of man is going to be killed. He's going to be handed over. Uh, but the disciples, just they don't get it. But then after Jesus was glorified, meaning after the resurrection, then they put it all together. And like, ah, oh, now we get it. And how many times has it been the case where for all of us, we remember like, oh, now I get why my parents told me X, Y, and Z. I didn't get it at the time, but at some point the light bulb goes on and we get it. So this is something where, where again, I'm, I'm giving you these two passages, these two verses here to exhort us that there are these seasons, there are these times of investment without necessarily going into that immediate understanding. Now, this is different than how adults function, right? We as adults tend to be much quicker. The gap, hopefully, is, is very narrow between when we learn something and when we understand it or put it into practice. But it's not like that for children. All right, this is a, a line that I got from Clayton Shank, who passed away last year, uh, that I think is, is gold, uh, that... I want to meditate on here. The line is, whoever laughs with your children has their heart. And, or maybe I should say hearts, plural. So one of the things here that I want to, to talk about is, I've mentioned this notion of relational investment and this concept that you can't delegate a relationship. You can't delegate your marital relationship. You can't delegate relationship with your children. You can't delegate relationship with anybody. You've got to be the one to make that investment. And one of the best litmus tests for that relationship is if you're laughing together. And this is something where, where again, we, we advocate homeschooling because we want to be the ones that are laughing with our children. We want to be the ones that have their hearts. Uh, so much of the book of Proverbs, you hear these lines like, my son, my child, give me your heart. Give me your heart. And how do we do that? How do we actually gain their hearts? This is so true and so powerful. And again, I, I think this line is, is one of the, probably the 10 maxims that we should be reviewing often as, as parents or as those who are supervising young people who may not be parents, which is that we need to be examining, are we walking with them in the channels that bring them delight and that, uh, that bring us delight, that we're, we're laughing together? Hey, just uh, a couple of days ago, I was playing chess with my son, my oldest son, and he's, he's 12 years old. And I used to beat him pretty consistently, and now it's flipped around where he's beating me pretty consistently. And we were playing, uh, and I could just feel, it was almost like a boa constrictor, kind of squeezing its, its victim. I felt like that when we were playing in this game here, where I just knew that I was going downhill fast. And there were a few moments where I just laughed and we laughed together and it was fantastic. It was just great. And to be able to bond with your children over whatever it is, whether it's, it's chess or 
hiking or you name it, this is such a powerful uh, way for us to make the kind of investment that is, is required to, again, keep their hearts, gain their hearts and keep their hearts. Okay, I'm gonna just spend probably 10 more minutes here and then I'll try to wrap up. All right, this is a passage from the New Testament. So we've talked now about the Old Testament. I wanna move into the New Testament. There's a great passage here. Again, another very well-known passage from 2 Timothy 3. I'll read this. This is Paul writing to Timothy, who says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so again, Paul here is writing to Timothy, and fascinating passage here, which brings together both elements of what I've been talking about. So again, the two elements from Deuteronomy were this relational connection where the parents are with the child throughout their day. When they're sitting in their home, when they're walking on the way, when they're lying down to go to bed at night, when they're getting up in the morning. And then there's also this, this instructive dimension where they're speaking about the commands of God. You see that perfectly here. Again, so let's reread this in a more careful way and look for both of those elements. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are, make, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All right, so did you notice this phrase here, knowing from whom you have learned them? And if you know about Paul and Timothy, he talks about uh, Eunice and Lois, his mother and his grandmother. And he's he's asking timothy to recall the people that have taught him what he has what he has learned he's asking him to remember the the character the qualities of these individuals that have have walked with him over the years okay so there's again that relational component there and then there's also this instructive component and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So he says, this is the New King James here that I, I pasted uh, onto this slide. So from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures. So this is obviously talking about, in Timothy's case, the Old Testament, because when he was young, the New Testament hadn't yet been written. Uh, but what we see here is that from a very young age, and we'll talk about what this age is, you have, Timothy has known, has been taught uh, by Lois, by Eunice, by his family members, not just the scriptures, but the holy scriptures. There is a reverence that was communicated to Timothy in his upbringing. This was not just any other book. This was the book that was able to, to present God as the holy one who's high and lifted up and the one who has uh, shepherded Israel through all of its uh, long journeys over the centuries. And these holy scriptures are able to make Timothy wise, able, competent for the salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so again, hopefully you see those, those two elements here, the personal investment and then the instructive investment there. I wanted to talk briefly about this word childhood here from childhood. Uh, there's a, a fascinating set of word studies that uh, some of us in intermediate Greek are, are embarking on here, but uh, where you can look at how a word is used in different contexts to help you understand the dimensions of what that word really means. And so we're going to look at this word here for childhood, which is the word brephos in Greek, and we're going to try to understand what does this mean? Is this like when he was a teenager? Is it like when he was a uh, elementary school age, what does this mean? What does this word brephos mean? So the word is used approximately half a dozen times in the New Testament. It might be seven, but I think it's six. And uh, I'm going to show you here three out of the six. They're all very, very similar. Uh, but let's just look at this word brephos and how it's used. All right. So the first time it's used in the New Testament is Luke 1 41. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So here, this word babe or baby is the word brephos. 
Uh, very interesting. So here we're actually talking about a fetus, right? So this is not even uh, someone that's been born yet. This is someone who's still inside of the womb uh, that is called a brepo. So this is pretty young age here. All right, the next time it's used, uh, it's used twice in that Luke 1 passage in the same context, but then it's used in Luke 2. This is speaking to the shepherds on, uh, on the time of Jesus' birth, and it says, and this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. So this is like a brand new newborn here, right? This is very, very, very young baby here that is meant by the word brephos here. So they, again, this is the word babe. And again, all of these are the New King James. All right, here's another one. First Peter chapter 2, verse 12. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Okay, so guess what word is used here? Again, brefo, same word here. So here what we can say is that this is still a baby who is in the nursing phase here because it says the, the baby is still drinking the milk of the word. And so you can put this together. I actually did a, pretty, a longer word study. You can look at how it's used in secular sources. In fact, this is like the youngest stage of babyhood or childhood. This is, this is like baby. Uh, interestingly, uh, pretty much all the translations say from childhood, ESV, I think New King James says that. Uh, the NIV, interestingly, says from infancy, which is probably the best, most accurate way to understand this. Uh, this is where I, again, I want to give a huge, uh, I have a huge debt of gratitude that I gave to my parents. And I remember my, my mom saying this to me so, so often. I remember thinking, like, why would you do this? She would say, starting at six months old, we would just read and read and read and read to you the Bible. And starting at age two, have you memorized the Bible? And they would sometimes play for us these tapes. I have one brother where they would say, see, we made you memorize the Bible when you were two years old. And you think, two years old? I mean, what do you really understand at two years old? Uh, but they would have us uh, memorize these huge sections of scripture, uh, just as very young children who could barely comprehend, I think, what we were even saying there. But now I go back, it's a little bit like that I was just telling you before. I'm like, ah, oh, now I get it. This is exactly this principle that is talked about in 2 Timothy 3. From infancy, you were acquainted with, you were taught, you were instructed with the Holy Scriptures. A very powerful idea. And I'm going to close here with an analogy on why you should be excited to do this for your children. And like I said, for those of you who are single, this means for all the children that you engage with and with new disciples that you engage with. All right, so the word of God is living, and we know that Jesus likes to use metaphors uh, like the word of God as seed, right? This is a famous passage, Matthew 13, several places this is described where the word of God is likened to being a seed. So what's so interesting about a seed is how explosive the potential is of a seed. And in particular, uh, a seed falls into the, the realm of, of biological growth. And as it turns out, biological growth follows a pattern of growth, which is exponential. Okay, it's, it's not linear, it's exponential. So if you plot it on a curve, it, it's accelerating growth over time. And there's a, a phrase, the eighth wonder of the world, which is supposedly from Einstein, I haven't looked this up, but Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein, the famous physicist said, do you, know what, do you know what the eighth wonder of the world is? And very interesting, he said, it's this, he says, it's compound interest. It's the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it, he who doesn't pays it. Very interesting. Why, why does he say this? Why would this man who figured out relativity and one of the most brilliant scientists of history say this? Well, he recognized how powerful this phenomenon of compound interest is to really shape the world. And my thesis to you is that the word of God, like biological systems, have this exponential compounding growth property to them that mean that those who make the investments in young people early are going to reap the benefits of compound interest. Now, a lot of you know I work in the business world and there's a couple of talks that I give that I use these analogies here. I'm going to share with you a couple lines from one of my talks that I give at Eventide. Uh, so there's a hypothetical here, a woman named Jennifer who invests $1,000 a year for eight years. 
Okay, so let's pretend she's from ages 21 to 28. And then she doesn't invest anything more for the rest of her life. Okay, so she just says, I'm gonna make an investment for a thousand dollars a year for eight years. And then there's an individual named Matt who invests a thousand dollars a year for 37 years. So that's from ages 29 to 65. So he picks up right where Jennifer stopped. Let's assume they're the same age too. So they're the same age, these two characters, Jennifer and Matt. And so if, like if we were in a room together, I would ask you how much total money did Jennifer invest in her savings here? It's very easy. It's $8,000, right? A thousand times eight uh, for her whole life. How much does Matt invest? Well, he invests $37,000 because it's a thousand times 37. Okay. And so let's assume for the, this example that both invest into a, let's say it's a mutual fund or a, a business or an account or a stock, who knows what, it doesn't matter what, but for round, for round numbers, we're going to say it returns 10% each year. All right. So then when they hit 65, what's fascinating is that Jennifer has $427,752 in her account. And Matt has $363,043. Okay, so what you can work this out if you don't believe me, put it in Excel or put it in a calculator, or you can figure it out yourself. So the one person who put in just $8,000 has way more money than the person who put in $37,000. And this is the magic of compound interest. This is why we need to remember that the Word of God when you get it in early and when you can make that investment, it compounds, it grows. It does these amazing, amazing things to change a life. I, I will say this, again, not as a parent, but as a son here, uh, that as I look now at my own life, my, my brother's life, and I do comparisons and contrasts with others, I think this is one of the most significant differentiations that I really thank my parents for. I had nothing to do with it. This is a pure expression of gratitude here that I want all of us to be doing in the lives of our children. One of the things that we do in our family devotion times, uh, and I gave this talk last time, is we we spend time memorizing. Basically every night we'll we'll be memorizing different different verses, different scriptures together, as well as doing our Bible journaling and reflecting together on all this. So powerful. This is the eighth wonder of the spiritual world. So with that, I'm going to close us out in prayer, and then I'll hand it back to Brother Clark. Our Father in heaven, we want to be effective uh, disciples of our children, recognizing that indeed the main channel for the transmission of the faith from one generation to the next is resident within the home. We bless you for that. We thank you for that. And I pray that you will give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Help us to listen to each other. Help us to seek out input from each other. I know that I need more input and all these things. Help us to be diligent. May the diligence of our parenting eclipse the diligence of every other facet of our, of our lives. May we invest uh, time and, and energy into relationship building. May we laugh with our children. May we be those who uh, don't attempt to delegate but draw our children close to our hearts. Help us to do well with just these bread and butter basics, God. Help us not to, to shirk from these, these repetitive investments that I know bring delight to your heart. Thank you, Father, that you've given us children that are like moist clay that can be shaped, that can be formed to be vessels of honor for your kingdom. We want to present them before you one day and say, behold, here am I and the children that you have given me. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.